Okay, um, thank you, Kenny. Um, so, um, well, this this talk, it, it's part of a somewhat broader um, project of mine, which is related to, to the role questions play in our uh, general cognitive activities or in our cognitive lives. And I'll, I'll be saying a few things then about um, questioning behavior. Um, there will we will come across a kind of chicken or egg problem that uh, has to be solved in some way, simply because it has been solved in some way. And um, the nature of questions um, related to a certain kind of prosociality. And um, if I have time towards the end, I'll be saying a few things about something I call Collingwoodian creatures. Okay, why, why would one want to look at, at questions? Well, one thing is that this is more or less a good candidate for being a uh, human universal. It seems that we find um, the use of questions everywhere we look, but it's also um, somewhat neglected because in, in Brown's list of human universals, you don't find asking questions. Um, at least last time I looked, maybe maybe the list has been updated. Um, and it's almost exclusively a human activity. Um, I, I put a question mark there simply because one is nearly always wrong in saying that something is an exclusively human activity. But it, it's at least clear that um, for any other species we care to look at, um, the asking and answering of something like questions doesn't seem to matter that much. They're, they're not uh, living a question infused, living in a question infused world. Um, ju just as Mark Hertz uh, was, was on about in the previous talk, um, normativity doesn't matter much for chimps, even if they perhaps can be uh, normative agents in certain respects. And um, asking questions simply doesn't matter much for other well, primates or other animals in general. It's also interesting, uh, the, the whole practice of using and um, answering questions uh, in that it's unlearned. In fact, it's, it's hard to see how we could come to learn to ask questions because it seems that uh, a very prerequisite for coming to um, learn something would be that one would have some kind of previous curiosity about it, which more or less amounts to one aspect of asking questions. Research has also shown that this is um, pretty clearly in human infants or pre-linguistic children um, an activity we find. There's something called in information requesting mechanisms to be found in pre-linguistic children. So we have something that is universal, not particularly important for uh, non-human animals, not learned, it's pre-linguistic or, or the basis of it is pre-linguistic. And it's also something that is very pervasive and it's pervasive in two senses. If you look at small children, Questions are asked all the time. There are estimates. I'll return to the estimates. Uh, but um, anyone who has spent time with a four-year-old knows that they do ask a lot of questions. And we all ask questions um, all, all the time. I've actually tried uh, going through a day, just as part of this project, um, I tried going through a day without asking a single question. I know it didn't work. Um, it's it's so pervasive, we do it all the time. And one reason for this is that our complex surroundings um, simply make questions necessary. And another interesting aspect of <clears throat> questions is that they are strongly tied, I return to in what ways, they're strongly tied to a certain kind of search for explanations looking for the mechanisms behind something or the causes for something. Okay, um, so we, 
we know the saying, curiosity killed the cat. And of course, we find curiosity in other animals. Um, that's, that's not particularly uh, new or anything. Um, what we do have uh, is, um, for instance, in a recent paper by Peter Carruthers, uh, Basic Questions from 2018, um, arguing that a, a set of questioning attitudes are among the foundations of human and animal minds. And I'm in full agreement here. Um, we have a kind of, uh, as, as I built face here, each uh, is better explained by a pre-linguistic sui generis type of mental attitude of questioning. So we do find questioning or, or a questioning attitude in animal in other animals as well. Um, but there's something special about the human um, asking of questions. And one special aspect of it can be seen here in the chicken and egg problem. Because um, raising a question is a linguistic activity. Um, but it seems that you can't really learn a language without asking questions. So which, which came first? Well, this is, of course, a problem that has been solved um, by evolution since there will be a Q&A um, period after this, after my talk, and, and you've all raised questions lots of times as kids and so on. So we are linguistic beings and we do use questions. So maybe we can bootstrap our way out of the problem. Of course, a protractor, a very long, um, evolutionary process might actually handle this in a nice way. Um, so let's take a look at seven precursors to full-on human linguistic asking questions. Um, so we do find examples of question-like behavior in other primates. Command gestures are quite common. We saw, we saw a list uh, from uh, Graham's paper on Bonobo gestures um, in, in the previous talk, and, and they were all more or less command gestures or begging gestures. Um, and they, these are quite common. Um, but do we find questions? Well, <clears throat> other primates can extract information from adult members of the group, uh, members who don't. Um, willingly donate information. So th there is a way of pulling information for, for younger primates. Um, and for instance, gorillas have something that has been called question bark. But it's, this is more like, huh? or something like that. It's just, oh, that I hadn't expected this. So, so there is some aspect of um, curiosity or mild alarm, just as when we say, oh, um, nothing, nothing much beyond that in gorillas. Um, we have the pant hoots that Goodall describes in um, chimps. One interesting thing here is that there's a rising pitch here, just as our, as the normal um, question intonation in many many languages across the world. Um, but one one special thing here is that. Um, the pant hooter, the pant hooting chimp will um, sort of send out a pant hoot, um, but it seems that the correct response for another chimp is to make more or less the same pant hoot, not to provide a morsel of information beyond what is provided by the very pant hoot. It's a bit like what happens when when we're out in the woods and say, I'm here, and, and someone else says, I'm here. Um, and and we, can, we can locate them by the way the sound has traveled to our ears and so on. So these are much more like statements than questions. And we, we can have other cases where chimps use some kind of rising intonation without a need for information, without expecting a response. And if we look at baboons, they, they have, a, at least male baboons, have a cutthroat hierarchical um, society. There, there would be little uh, place for a baboon to start 
looking for information because what do you do when you look for information if you ask questions of someone else because that's what's special about human questioning behavior we ask questions of other conspecifics of caregivers is the starting point animals non-human animals tend to look to, to sort of question their surroundings they don't look for information via um, information that is provided by other uh, by their conspecifics and we, we can see why we shouldn't really expect baboons to do this may at least not male baboons their cutthroat uh, hierarchical world would i mean it's standing up and saying i don't know this or that or please tell me this or that if every interaction in the baboon world with another male baboon is sort of um, uh, highly transactional and almost antagonistic all the time, um, there's no way you could ask your potential enemy um, about a piece of information. The, the enemy would always uh, give the wrong information. Because that's that's what would be in their interest, or the the enemy, the potential enemy, would al always be in a position to use um, knowledge of my lack of information about a specific thing. So it seems that in 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 such societies as male baboon hierarchical societies, um, asking questions can't really get a foothold. We can't arrive at uh, questions that way. But we can in humans, because we have the right kind of social environment. Um, people ask and answer questions because we're not worse off by doing this. Because human society is highly cooperative and we coordinate our activities in ways that at least go far beyond what we find in non-human primates. Um, so what we have is, it, this is then a special case of, of the kind of collective intentionality that Tomasello and others have stressed so strongly. Um, asking questions is a kind of special case, but a highly special case of collective intentionality. Because collective intentionality in general, that, that can cover collective hunting or collective gathering or, or things like that, where, where everything we have our collective attitudes towards is um, <clears throat> out in nature or, or something objective out there. What's going on in questioning is coordinating a special kind of um, internal states. I know this or that and I am prepared to um, provide that kind of information. So that, that, those were um, sort of the groundwork where we could say that um, even if there, there can be cases where non-human primates do something like questioning or asking others, um, it, it can't really get much of a foothold in their kinds of um, communities. Whereas in humans, we get it all the time. And uh, there is a nice monograph by Michel Chouinard on, on children asking questions. Um, and she talks about the information requesting mechanism because she's, one of the things she's interested in is uh, pre-linguistic children. What do they do that amounts to providing questions? Um, and they start doing this very, very early. It's a pre-linguistic activity, looking at the caregiver to provide them with information, uh, coaxing information from someone. And again, it's, so one of her studies um, looked specifically at pre-verbal children. Um, and she found that all the components of the information requesting mechanism are in place and um, finds that 
specifically pre-verbal children recruit information using gesture and vocalizations. Five minutes left. Yep, good. Um, so again, as I stated before, it's an unlearned activity. Children ask lots of questions. Uh, there are various um, estimates being bandied about. I've heard 400 a day. I've heard uh, 10,000 a year looking for explanations. And a, qu a quarter of all questions children ask are uh, requests for explanations. So that, that would put a pretty high number on it. Um, of course, there are there are lots of other uh, kinds of questions. Uh, children ask, "Are we there yet?" And, and so on. And who's that? And can I have another cookie? Um, but looking for explanations are perhaps cognitively more interesting. And another thing is that children are very very tenacious. They keep going. Um, of course, they can be stopped in certain certain not very agreeable ways, but um, in the natural course of things, they tend to go on until satisfied, um, looking for explanations. And these explanations are often of a causal or mechanical um, kind. They, they want to find the mechanism behind this. Okay, um, Collingwoodian creatures. Collingwood, um, British philosopher, archeologist, historian, uh, wrote in 1940. Um, every statement that anybody ever makes is made in answer to a question. And I think you, you wanted to sort of um, take this a bit further. And, and his idea was that any belief anyone ever had was um, the result of a question. Internal states are results of questions for, for him. Um, okay, given, given time, I'll actually skip uh, those steps and um, <clears throat> let me see. I, okay, I can, I can take that one there. Um, okay, one, when Dennett describes in, from, for instance, from Bacteria to Bach, he, he describes the different steps uh, of cognitive achievement or cognitive abilities that we find in various kinds of creatures. And he, he finds Gregorian um, creatures are the, as it were, highest level. And he, he thinks that only human beings are Gregorian creatures, apparently. And these have thinking tools, abstract or concrete. Um, and we use the design portions of the outer environment and no other um, creatures do this. Deliberate introduction and use of thinking tools, systematic exploration of possible solutions to problems, attempts at higher order control and mental searches. Now, um, I think we should actually add to the Gregorian um, creature, we should have a, yet another level, which I think is uh, alongside with the Gregorian, and that is specifically the, the Collingwoodian creature, a creature that actually fully um, lives its cognitive life by asking questions about the world and about the ways others understand. I won't go into that one, um, but I'll finish up with someone who has thought a great deal about chimps and humans and possible um, differences and likenesses between them. And it's a nice um, brief quote that I think um, pinpoints a few of these um, issues related to the centrality of questions. <clears throat> Though um, Goodall puts uh, the ability to ask questions is as a consequence of our sophisticated spoken language. I don't think we'd have a sophisticated spoken language without the pre-linguistic kind of um, ability and drive to ask questions. 
So therefore, um, the use of questions in understanding the evolution of language is something that I think is a bit understudied as um, a general area. Okay, that's more or less my minutes up, I guess, Karim. So thank you.